Today's episode is brought to you by public.com, an investing platform which you'll be hearing more about later on in the show. But for now, let's get into today's interview. Welcome to another edition of Forward Guidance. This time I am joined by Stephen Kelly, Senior Research Associate at the Yale Program on Financial Stability and our frequent uh, co-host and guest, Joseph Wang, uh, founder at fedguy.com, as well as the Chief Investment Officer of Monetary Macro. Gentlemen, great to have you here. Good to be here. Great to be here, Jack, and great to see you, Steve. Yeah, likewise. Yeah, so Stephen, you're an expert in uh, financial crises, and people, you know, myself included, are, are very dramatic, and they call anything a crisis. You know, this is a crisis, that's a crisis, but your definition of a crisis is very specific, and it has a very high standard for a, a financial crisis. So, what is a financial crisis as you define it? Your, you know, your team at Yale, um, and then how does it differ from like a vanilla recession or some sort of minor blow up in the you know hinterlands of the, the financial system? Yeah, so I, I would say there's definitely a distinction between uh, what I would call a financial crisis and what I would call a market crisis. Like you said, a lot of folks will sort of ask leading questions to get someone to say Lehman. Um, and, you know, now we have all we have all varieties of Lehman. There's a climate Lehman. There's <clears throat> in Korea, there's a Legoland Lehman right now. Uh, all kinds of Lehman moments. Uh, but it, in reality, the last Lehman moment we had was Lehman. Um, so I, I kind of think about uh, a financial crisis as the perceived insolvency of the financial system, uh, or at least sort of a domino effect of the systemic financial actors perceived insolvency. So if in the event that you cannot aggregate the system, uh, do you have systemic players that are perceived to be insolvent at the core of the banking system versus a market crisis, which would look more like long-term capital management. It like, might look like the, the nickel market, um, you know, we're inclined to, to call these things systemic, especially those who have a lot to lose in those situations are inclined to call them systemic, uh, sometimes because they want to bail out. Uh, but that's not that's not a situation where the banking system ceases to function. Uh, and, and, you know, every business in the economy is is effectively a customer of the banking system. Not every not every business is a customer of you know, the LME or of long-term capital management. And so those things have recessionary impacts. They have macroeconomic impacts. They seem like a crisis because some market goes haywire, uh, but it, it's we're not talking about a 10-year recovery in the absence of a serious policy response. I think Steve Steve's um, definition is, is really good. It makes a ton of sense. So so one of the things about Lehman was that that made it systemic was that it would, as, as um, Steve noted, affect all of us. So Back then, um, it was a crisis of the banking sector, and if the bank and we're all connected to the bank sector, I mean, if you have money, you you put it in a bank, right? So, uh, if there are problems with the banking sector, then you no, know, and you have a lot of, let's say, deposits out of banks, so you're lending the bank a lot of money above and beyond federal insurance, then then obviously that puts you at risk, and you know nobody wants to see all their money go poof. And at the same way, many people depend upon banks for credit. So that's something that is very much touches a broad scope of the economy. So I think that's a good definition of, of a, a crisis or more simply, whenever the Fed has an emergency meeting, I think that's a, <laughs> that rises to the crisis level. Mm, thanks, Joseph. And so Stephen, in the, you said we haven't had a Lehman moment since Lehman, you know, since Lehman Brothers was allowed to go bankrupt uh, in I think August of, of 2008. If I were to ask you, why is that the case? Why have we have not had these uh, systemic crises? Uh, to, to what would you attribute it? Would it be you know the ample reserve regime of the Federal Reserve? Would it be uh, regulatory regimes like like Basel III, which you know you can get into? Would it be uh, you know the the Bernanke put as as some people uh, propose? The story is one about bank capital um, and and the post crisis regime. I mean, part of this we just need to step back and say these events are rare, right? Lehman events are rare. Uh, you have a macroeconomic story and a uh, confluence of factors, basically, that leads to 2008 in, in the macro situation. Uh, but we have a we have a new regime, and it takes time for risks to build around a new regulatory regime. And what we saw in 2020, and again, there's there's a thousand asterisks next to 2020 because the policy response was so good or so active, rather. Uh, but we saw a resilient banking system. That, that was able to continue to function through the crisis. And, and a big part of that is the 
post-2008 reaction, which was to find capital where we could and shove it into the banking system. Uh, and basically, we basically decided, you know, we're not we're not OK with the trade off that we had before of, you know, banks clean up the mess and we let them run down their capital ratios because that works most of the time. And it just didn't in 2008. And we decided, OK, you know, we need to think more about the two sided risks here. We need more capital at the core of the system because it's really hard to find capital in a crisis. So when, when Stephen is saying capital, that's like a liability of the bank. So what that means is that let's say the bank makes a loan and it starts to lose money in that loan. What happens is that, that those losses, the capital buffers those losses. So the amount of capital that has the bank has is basically the level of losses it, it can absorb. And if it doesn't have a lot of capital like it didn't back in uh, during the great financial crisis, then the bank goes bust and then it goes bankrupt like Lehman. And as we all know, that's not good. So like Stephen mentioned now is that uh, by increasing the amount of capital in the bank, the amount of loss absorbing capacity the banking sector has, that, that makes it less likely that a bank would go bust. And so that makes the financial system safer. Thanks, and so, sir. And, and yeah. I'll just add a couple things there, actually. And just to just to further Joseph's point, I mean, one thing to keep in mind, and this often gets lost, and especially when you're a failed bank, um, you know, Sam Bankman Freed, not a banker, but has been making this argument lately of, oh, we were solvent at the time of failure. You know, Lehman makes the argument, we were solvent. And maybe they were from an accounting perspective, but what matters is the perception of enough capital um, as much as having enough capital to buffer those losses. Because you don't want to be a counterparty of a bank that might not have enough capital um, when, when you have other options and you have safer options. So that's a big piece of it is, you know, we, we tried to shove all this capital into the banking system because we don't want that perception of the system being undercapitalized. Um, and the other thing to remember is, this is a scarce resource. So sometimes this issue gets oversimplified where especially, you know, Uber progressives will say, look, banks just need to do more, fund themselves with more capital, more equity capital, you know, boohoo, they don't want to, they want to have higher, you know, use more leverage and get higher returns for shareholders, but they just need more equity capital. But that's not what a bank is, right? Anybody, you could make an app that, that sends equity from, from lenders to borrowers, right? Uh, but what a bank is, is something that creates leverage. It creates deposits for you and me. It creates, you know, sort of the, the base of the pyramid of financial needs in, in the world, which is deposits, um, you know, repo, short term, you know, commercial paper, liquidity um, and that and, and the ability to get a, a loan overnight, which it funds by creating a deposit uh, at the same time. Uh, so that's what a bank is. And you, you, you simply can't have a bank that's all equity funded because there's no deposits funding it then. I mean, you're not a bank. Um, so that's the other thing to remember is that this is a scarce resource. It's not an infinite thing that we can just switch out, you know, debt for equity. Yes, as you write on your excellent uh, Substack, without warning, leverage is not a byproduct, byproduct of the financial system. It is its primary output. So, Stephen, when we talk about uh, cap capital and, and, you know, capital ratios, what are we talking about? I know there may be two or, or three capital tier ratios and how are they different? You know, th these ratios are demanded by uh, the Federal Reserve go go governing bodies. How are they different uh, in the wake of the great financial crisis before? You know, what, what were the sort of the leverage ratios at Lehman Brothers, uh, you know, Citibank prior and what are they now? Not that Lehman Brothers exists. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, I mean, broad strokes, there's risk-based capital and risk-insensitive capital or non-risk-based capital. So the, the risk-based capital ratio is based on the riskiness of your assets. So there are different equity charges or you know different amounts of equity that a bank needs to hold based on the riskiness of their assets. So if I hold a junk bond uh, or if I hold an investment grade bond versus if I hold a U.S. Treasury, um, you know that's going to affect how much capital I need to hold. And the other there's also leverage ratios and there's a supplementary leverage ratio, which includes off balance sheet exposures. That's a post crisis uh, evolution. But these are designed to basically prevent gaming of the system. So this is just whatever asset you have, you know, it's 4% capital, it's 3% capital, uh, it depends, you know, who you are. Um, but the idea is let's prevent banks from figuring out how to game the system. And, uh, you know, part of the, I mean, this was part of the issue, particularly in Europe ahead of 2008 was uh, they, they basically just gamed their risk scores and they, they lost all correlation between how much capital, uh, you know, between their non-risk-based leverage ratios and their risk-based 
uh, leverage. There should be some correlation. Um, and they had just gamed the system. Uh, so, so that's a concern. So those are the two key facets. I, I mean, and broadest strokes, they've gotten tougher post-2008. Uh, the ratios have increased. We now do stress testing uh, on a regular basis here in the U.S., which sets, sets capital ratios. Uh, so basically, both of these were designed to increase, and, and the supplementary leverage ratio was designed to bring off-balance sheet exposures uh, onto the balance sheet and, and force banks to hold capital against them. So what were yeah. these ratios like before the crisis, and what are they now? Oh, right. Right, yeah. So really, on the eve of the crisis, the investment banks were leveraging themselves like 35 to 1. So you're talking about uh, a 25 3% move in your assets effectively makes you insolvent. Um, and that's where that perception of, of you know, capital insolvency comes into play because all of a sudden you have, you have this housing risk that you can say it fell from the sky. You can say it was an act of God, the subprime market, what's going on in the subprime market. And without affecting your capital, now the asset side of your book, the perceived risk, if not the real risk, has gone way up. Um, and suddenly 3% capital doesn't look like enough to keep you solvent. Uh, so these ratios are much higher now. Risk-based capital will be, often be 12, 13, 14%, you know, depending on the bank. Uh, Non-risk-based capital, the largest banks have to hold 5%. So that's a 20 to 1 cap um, on, your lever on your overall leverage, regardless of assets. So they're, they're much stricter, uh, much more capital in the system. I, I can add to that. So back, back in the uh, pre-GFC days, so like Steve mentioned, one of the ways you could game the system. So the system wants you to hold more capital against assets that are riskier. That makes sense, right? If you have an asset that is more likely to default, like a subprime mortgage, you want to hold more capital against it because it's possible you would have more losses and more capital protects the uh, the other, um, I guess, depositors from, from, um, from a bankrupt bank. And one of the ways you could game that would be actually just through ratings. So back then, pre-GFC, you know, ratings were an unregulated industry. So you could just, you know, call up a few ratings agencies and see if they would stamp your your asset with, a, you know, a AAA or something like that. Then you would not have to hold as much capital against it because it would be a safe asset. I used to actually work for a ratings agency. And what I would see happen sometimes is that, so the uh, the bankers would call us for a, for a deal and basically try to figure out how high a rating that we could give them. And you know, they'd call, and then if we would say A, and they wanted something like A plus, that, then they would get, kind of disappear, and we never hear from them again. And maybe a few weeks later, we would hear that another rating agency was able to offer them what they wanted, and so they went with them. So this this prospect of actually shopping around ratings uh, was a way to to game game the um, uh, the regulatory framework. But that's that's a lot a lot has been done to improve that so far. So that's all more regulated, and there. Are, stress tests now. So the Fed actually uh, makes banks test their um, their assets according to uh, specified parameters, like the banks run their own, but the Fed also runs their own model as well. So that's an improvement. Uh, and, and like Stephen said, the off balance sheet stuff was a, was a really big innovation. So pre GFC, you could have a lot of what, what would count towards regulations um, was not the same as the actual risk that a bank held because a lot of it was in terms of um, off balancing derivatives that really wouldn't show up on a on a standard regulatory balance sheet. But since then, they've added supplementary leverage ratios, which Stephen mentioned, that forces banks to include that potential future exposure into their um, their leverage ratio. So again, it's making the system a lot safer. That's fascinating. Of, what where were you like a uh, ratings agency, and what were you what were you rating? Uh, actually, securitized products. <laughs> When? when? Uh, oh no! This is after the after the crisis. So it was when the ratings agencies were very boring and highly regulated. Uh, they would tell me back then, uh, pre GFC, man, times are good. We had all these. It, it was like working at a tech company. You would have these huge pantries full of all sorts of snacks. You can eat as much as you want, and that was all gone when I was there. Because because back in the pre GFC world, you know, so it, it was like Fannie Mae selling insurance, right? You would rate AAA something collect um, you know tremendous tremendous um like ratings fees so ratings agencies if you look at moody's for example which is publicly treated they they print money because it costs a lot of money to get it rated 
And then there afterwards, there's an ongoing revenue stream where you pay, you know, a lot of money to to have it monitored every 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 year. So to maintain your rating, which really takes like 10 minutes for the ratings agency. So they have this tremendous in income stream. And back then, because um, first of all, there's a lot of issuance in securitization. So every issuance requires a rating. And also because, you know, house prices only went up. So you could say whatever and no one ever defaulted and no one really cared. And so they, they really just printed money back then. And uh, it, they still do pr very well. Mm -hmm. and, and Jack, part of the part of the story here too is, I mean, that that illustrates how much incentive there is across the system to economize on capital. So sometimes the rating agency story gets told as like, uh, you know, the rating agencies rated stuff AAA and then went and sold them to Joe, Tom, and Sue. Uh, and, and that's not really the story. I mean, nobody lost bigger on on highly rated stuff in 2008 than the banks. Uh, and everybody had an incentive basically to mark this stuff higher than it was. And everybody knew, I mean, the whole street knew, the whole street was doing the same thing that Joseph described. They were playing the rating agencies off each other. They were getting higher ratings. Um, the, the buyers of the assets wanted the highest deal they could get with the highest rating. Uh, so, so this was, you know, a, a world that was dying for money like assets, dying for safe assets, uh, dying for things they could issue leverage against. And everybody knew this stuff was rated too high, but the, the, the incentives were all aligned across the system to run this machine on as little capital as possible because it's a scarce resource. So Stephen, if I were to ask you at this juncture right now, you know, February 13th of 2023, how are you assessing the risk of a financial crisis? And when you give your answer, what are the metrics that you're considering? So it's, you know, I'm tempted to say bank capital because that is what's made the system safer. Um, I know I, I've probably been a bank capital broken record so far in this conversation, but that is, that's the hard part. I will say, uh, you know, we've come a long way in the science of providing liquidity uh, far and wide in a crisis. It's really hard to manufacture capital because the Fed just can't do it. Uh, central banks just can't do it. Uh, so to look at the system and say, okay, it's the banks are super highly capitalized. Um, to the market blowups we've seen, we haven't really had the fear of a bank going down. Um, that makes me feel good about, about where the system is at right now. Uh, but the other thing to say is, I mean, no amount of capital is enough. So you look at the you look at the pre-2008 model and the big banks are running, some of them, you know, 3% simple leverage ratio, they got 3% capital. That's probably fine most of the time, right? I mean, that's that's the way to run Lehman most of the time. That's the way to run Merrill Lynch most of the time. It's just sometimes it's really, really not. And I mean, you can look at Credit Suisse right now, 14% capital, and the whole market's calling it undercapitalized. Uh, you know, the, the, the shares trading at two bucks a share, like, you know, it's never enough capital. Uh, for 100% of the situations. And that's why we still have financial crises. You want banks to be banks, there's going to be there's going to be risks like this. So, you know, I don't see the risk of a financial crisis in that sense. Going back to my original definition of, you know, are we going to run into a situation of perceived insolvency of the system? I would say we're, we're very, very far from that. And, and the macro situation is just too strong um, right now. Uh, but would we see, you know, another hedge fund blow up that maybe hurts hurts some banks like it did Credit Suisse, for example. I mean, that was kind of the, the match that lit their fire uh, the last couple of years. Um, you know, I, I, I certainly could see things like that. Um, we, we could see a fund blow up. We could see another market blow up, whether it's in commodities or, you know, the treasury market liquidity or wherever else. Um, but, you know, I feel good about financial crisis risk at the moment. Just to go in on Credit Suisse, as you say, trading at, at two uh, bucks a share, a little over that. Um, how was that not systemic? How would a potential, you know, failure of Credit Suisse, um, you know, not that I'm calling it as you know like to happen, but how would that not cause a financial crisis in the same way that the uh, uh, Lehman did? And by the way, when I'm asking this question for folks who are listening to this, like there are a lot of differences, so don't assume that I'm equating them. Uh, so I just looked that up. So just for reference, guys, Credit Suisse. And uh, you know, in in back in the GFC days, it was about twenty eight dollars. Today, it's trading at three dollars. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, it has not been doing well. Yeah, and and I, I you know, it's hard to 
UBS might have gotten the most money of any. UBS got a huge chunk of change in 2008, and now they're looking like they could be the white knight for for Credit Suisse. And, and that's part of your your answer, Jack, which is, I mean, the question of a bank going down is it systemic? Is who can buy it? And in a financial crisis, nobody can buy it because every bank, you know, if you buy it, you're the next bank to go. And we can try this a little bit. And this goes back to why we have more capital in the system now. Like if you look at 2007, if the crisis ended in 2007, you have, you know, Bear Stearns buys up its hedge funds. You have Citi bringing a bunch of off balance stuff back onto its balance sheet. Bank of America buys countrywide, right? So it, we kind of have that where there were buyers still, you know, for a seller that could sort of absorb the risks onto a more aggregated balance sheet. Um, once you... It just be, it just was too much in 2008. Once 2008 proceeded, it became too much. JP Morgan bought Bear Stearns, yep, but then the system was even weaker, and Lehman Lehman toppled the system, right? Um, so right now, Credit Suisse has can get a buyer, or it can it could wind it can its business can go elsewhere pretty easily, um, and it's just so that's not systemic. It's when the it's when the buyer then goes down, or when there's another domino to fall thereafter. And right now, it looks like. Uh, you know, it's just blood in the water. It's not. It's not the system going down. Yeah, and also just a, a, like a quick scan of, of through Credit Suisse, the it, it's that it's losing money as a business. Its costs exceed its its revenue. It's not. It's that it owns a bunch of you know toxic assets that are grossly overvalued that are funded by short term liabilities. It's kind of a a, a a different thing, right? Yeah, it's a question of can it be a going concern, and a lot of that. You know, like especially wealth management and stuff, somebody else can pick that up pretty easily. Uh, but we've seen like like their trading book is you know the revenues were down ninety six percent in equities trading. Like that's that business is just gone. They're losing employees to other banks. That their business is just gone. Um, so it, it's a dicey situation. But you know they're they're fanning out across the street, and and that business can be absorbed. Right now, I want to uh, now turn to Joseph, which is how do you think the Federal Reserve thinks about financial crises, do they have as high a standard as uh, Stephen does? In other words, you know, a failure of a, a bank that if it doesn't go systemic, they don't consider that a crisis. And then also, you were at the Federal Reserve when the you know, Federal Reserve injected you know, well over a trillion dollars of liquidity in a, in a few weeks uh, during March 2020. How, you know, what was the Federal Reserve trying to accomplish by providing you know, such a large amount of, of liquidity? And what was it like? I think one reason why we see fewer financial crises, and in my view, it's less likely to see financial crises in the private sector going forward, is as Stephen mentioned that we've we've really learned from the Lehman episode. So heading into Lehman, I remember back then the the commentary was like we have to bleed moral hazard out of the financial system. That is to say that you know if we if we help these guys here and when they're in trouble, then that means that uh, that kind of takes away their incentive to behave properly. And so that encourages more bad behavior that creates moral hazard. So we got to let them fail. And after they did that, they realized, actually, that's not a good idea. And so going forward, uh, it, they didn't just make the financial system safer through the regulations. I, I think they're less inclined to, uh, to take that risk to, of letting the system, I guess, uh, have distress because they realize the consequences are were very bad. So the current crop of regulators, a lot of them cut their teeth in the time of Lehman. So they're very scared of this. And so their instinct, I think, is to intervene and step into the market to prevent any type of crises. So in 2020, when we had, I guess, some disruption in the financial sector, uh, they, they kind of really showed that. They, they opened up the emergency lending facilities for a wide range of financial sector actors, and including actors that they have not lent to before in the past. So I think that impulse, that, I guess, trauma from Lehman makes it unlikely for Lehman to occur simply because everyone is scared of it and they have the tools to stop that. Yeah, and I'll just add that what we don't know, I mean, I would say 2020 was a little easier in the sense that there wasn't an obvious villain. Um, so it was sort of easier for the Fed and others to deny any sort of moral hazard um, you know, there was sort of this we're all in this together type feeling with COVID. And now, I mean, the federal government has new authority to wind down a systemically important uh, 
you know, a systemically important bank, a non-bank, a uh, large bank holding company. They have these new authorities. And, you know, that sort of remains to be seen how effective those are and whether they can be done um, without much disruption to the system. Uh, but like Joseph said, you know, we have to, we have policymakers have to let be willing to let that happen in the first place, which maybe would be a mistake and maybe wouldn't be. Uh, but they're also the, the reverse risk is also there that, okay, we have these new wind down tools. Um, let's give them a shot and, and something still goes haywire. And Stephen, how do you, how would you have assessed financial crisis risk during March of 2020 when you know, the entire world shut down and uh, for a few days, markets were incredibly illiquid. I mean, you know, the, the VIX, the you know, stock market VIX went to uh, like something like 80. And on the most liquid collateral in the world, treasuries, it was very hard to do, do deals, um, even though you know, the world was facing a, a huge and imminent and giant re recession. Yields were rising on treasuries just because there was no liquidity. The Federal mm -hmm. Reserve used its balance sheet to uh, you know, compress that spread. But in the absence of a, of a Federal Reserve compressing that spread, a lender mm -hmm. last resort, dealer grass last resort, however you, you want to put it, I mean, what what do you think? Do you think that that had the ability to to spiral on itself and you know have really bad consequences? If we're taking a total Andrew Mellon like version of the Fed, uh, you know, if they sat on their hands in March 2020, certain, I mean, that that seems like incredibly risky. That and it would be my base case that we would have had a financial crisis at that point. Um, but you know, I, I don't know. It, it's an interesting question to say, like, what if the Fed like shirk its responsibility? Like to me, that was a pretty obvious case. It wasn't like a do they cut rates, don't they? To me, that was a pretty obvious case of the Fed's got to do something. Um, but you know that it, it was like the the dog that ended up not barking. Um, I would say at the time, you know, we didn't necessarily know we didn't have a vision for what COVID would look like long term, and it was never it was it never got to that scary point. I will say that, and part of it was was really how fast the Fed was, but it never got to the point of like, oh my God, this bank or that bank might go down. Uh, you know, credit default swap spreads never really blew out. It was never really like a major, major rumors swirling around a given bank. Like it just didn't have any of those components of fear of a financial crisis. Um, and, and a lot of that I think is due to the Fed and how fast it was. If you've been listening to Forward Guides, you probably know that treasury yields have been surging. Right now with US treasury bills, you can get a 4.9% yield on your cash. That's pretty good. It's even better than what you get with a traditional high yield savings account. So owning US treasuries is great. But buying U.S. Treasuries is super complicated, or at least it was. You used to have to go to a bank or navigate a government website that looked like it was designed in the 90s. Thankfully, investing platform public.com has changed all that with the launch of Treasury accounts. Now you can move your cash into U.S. Treasuries right from your phone. And you can do it with the flexibility of a bank account. There are no minimum hold periods or settlement delays. In other words, you can access your cash whenever you want. And the best part is that because it's government-backed treasury bills, it's an incredibly safe place to park your cash. Public will even automatically reinvest your treasury bills at maturity, so you don't have to do anything to continue growing your yield. A year ago, your cash earned you nothing. Now it can yield up to 4.9%. So what are you waiting for? Go to public.com slash forward guidance to move your cash into a treasury account today. Thanks, and let's get back to the episode. Joseph, be, you know, being at the Federal Reserve during March of 2020, how were they perceiving the the risks, and um, yeah, how are you assessing market liquidity? I mean, something can oh, the index is only going to forty, the look, but it's it's possible that there's simply no quotes going on. You know, I mean, it's if if there's no liquidity at all, things actually might not look that bad, right? Because it's you know, oh, yeah. the stock's still trading at ten dollars, even though there hasn't been a bid since you know three days ago. Um, and then also, how do you think the Federal Reserve assessed the ability of you know, huge rate cuts of going, you know, cutting rates to zero as versus the um, um, inordinate amount of quantitative easing or balance sheet operations of, of you know, buying tons of, of agency securities and treasuries, uh, which do you think was more effective and which did the Fed think was more effective? And then I want to get Stephen's take on, on which is more effective. You know, my perception being on the open market desk back then was that there was tremendous amounts of panic and the Fed was really just willing to do anything to, to make it go away. And uh, I mean, remember our chat with, uh, with Nick Tamarios on his book, and one of the things his book reviewed was the Fed was actually inching close, potentially even buying uh, mutual fund shares. So they were willing to provide liquidity 
to a wide range of non-bank financial institutions. And um, what was what actually was rolled out it was what was actually contemplated was more than what was actually rolled out because conditions um, improved. So that that kind of, in, in my view, kind of completely forgets the the moral hazard concerns of of acting in this way, um, because when you, I think. I think people, I think moral hazard is a legitimate concern because if everyone perceives that the Fed is going to step in and support, say, the private credit market, um, whenever there is a significant distress, then your incentive obviously is to uh, you know, just lever up and not worry about this. So what was something that the private investors once had to worry about now because of the Fed's actions is something that they've outsourced to the Fed to worry about. So I think socializing all this risk has some consequences that probably are not apparent immediately, but may become more apparent later on as people adapt their behavior to to kind of um, not price in certain risks. Now, about whether or not rate cuts or uh, I guess the balance sheet, how they operate, I think they operate in different channels. And back then, what you really wanted was... Um, was a more quantity based approach because you needed some people needed actual cash. Uh, it wasn't that they needed cash at a certain interest rate. They just needed cash. And the Fed was able to provide that by simply stepping into the market, printing money and buying their assets. So really playing a dealer of last resort or, you know, in a sense, a lender of last resort role by uh, being willing to monetize a lot of the um, assets that the that the private sector wanted to sell. So I think it was the right choice. Yeah, I would totally agree with with Joseph. And it goes back to the point you were making, Jack, of what's important is that there's a price um, more so than what the price is. I mean, classic financial crisis dynamics is total adverse selection and no trading occurs, um, you know, but 10% annualized for 10 million bucks is what, like 50 bucks a night, you know, like, so like that, that's not what matters in a crisis is, is the, is the rate it's, it's, can the fed step in and, and keep a market machine moving basically. Um, but you know, the, the rates were necessary for what became a severe recession, the rate cuts. Um, and they, you know, it affects asset pricing in a way that probably at the margin reduces any sort of, you know, pricing pinch or collateral calls, you know, it's helpful in that sense. But you know, probably the bigger channel is the Fed stepping into the market itself. So just to be clear, both of you agree that on the margin, the Fed's expansion of its balance sheet in March 2020 was a more powerful force to to restore liquidity and prevent a crisis than was there the rate cuts. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, think about what happened when the corporate bond market. The corporate bond market is you know 10, 11 trillion dollars in size. Fed rolls out these um, special lending facilities total outstanding loans under those facilities, I don't think ever exceeded 15 billion. So it was a tiny, tiny sliver of the um, corporate bond market, but just the willingness of doing something new, of stepping in, that signal just completely unfroze the market. So that that was, in my view, much more powerful and, and direct and targeted towards, towards um, what was actually the problem rather than something very macro, like uh, cutting interest rates, which feeds through the financial system in all sorts of channels and not necessarily to where you uh, where you want to ease. Yes, and I remember Warren, Warren Buffett saying that there were days on which he didn't think that Berkshire Hathaway, you know, the ultimate blue chip company, you know, second only I guess to Apple or you know other micro cap, my, my, you know, giant uh, market cap companies like that, uh, could he couldn't think they could, he could refinance its debt, which is truly truly stunning. And he notes that you know within a few weeks later after the Federal Reserve had done its operations. Carnival cruises and cruise lines, which you know were basically insolvent, uh, could raise that. So that's how big of a, of a change it happened. And I'd also note, Joseph, yeah, the, the Federal Reserve's um, announcement of its, you know, buying uh, corporate debt, including uh, high yield debt, they only had to buy a, a very small amount of that debt because it was the idea that the notion that the Federal Reserve was there. Uh, that that improved market psychology. Say, oh, the Federal Reserve has my back. So you know, if you if you carry a big stick, you don't have to use it. Um, um, so goes the recent. Okay, so we talked about rate cuts versus expansion of the balance sheet in March of 2020. What about rate hikes versus reduction of the balance sheet over the past year and now? The Federal Reserve is doing quantitative tightening now, reducing its balance sheet as well as hiking rates. Uh, it has done a, a lot of hike rate hikes uh, last year, and you know, 
maybe has a few more uh, in, in its uh, chamber, um, in its quiver this year. How does that alter financial uh, risk? You know, Stephen, number one, using your uh, rigid definition of financial crisis, as well as a softer definition of just, you know, uh, uh, sort of how, what are the what are, what are the odds that it causes um, a blow up that's not systemic? You know, it doesn't have to be a Lehman moment, but just you know, problems. Yeah, I would say the latter is certainly more likely. I mean, I just sort of as a matter of fact, as you drain reserves from the system, the risk goes up that they're not in the right place at the right time, uh, which means somebody gets pinched on a payment. Uh, you know, hit, gets hit with a collateral call they can't meet. Uh, so, so that risk certainly goes up and. You know, that, that's like the 2019 repo blow up type risk where there just aren't enough reserves in the right place at the right time. Uh, and that's sort of a market stability issue. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't really raise to the level of like a Lehman type thing, like you said. Uh, so that risk certainly goes up. And, you know, th th there's financial tightening from the rate hike side, of course, too. And, and you see various distress start to rise up as a result of that. I mean, e even liquidity in the treasury market has gone down as rates have gone up. Um, but also, we, we've sort of seen the the sort of burn come in from the outside of the financial system. Crypto blew up, like you know, thinly capitalized mortgage lenders. Suddenly, their their you know rate spread doesn't look so good. Uh, firms like Carvana, you know, just that's that type of risk goes up with with the rate rises. I think that's a good point. I mean, maybe we have seen the blow ups, right? So the crypto world absolutely blew up. And I remember from our conversation with Harley Bassman. You know, he suggested that, you know, the treasury market kind of did blow up already. And we do, we did see not as obviously, of course, but uh, more obviously the guilt market blew up as well. So uh, we have seen some localized areas of distress, just nothing, just hugely systemic. So, you know, I was just spoken, speaking with an expert on um, liquidity, Michael Howell, just you, you, we spoke to, and yes. he noted that treasury market liquidity uh, has actually improved since October. And the UK guilt crisis you referred to, Joseph, was in you know, very late September. Uh, how is it possible that liquidity can improve when the Federal Reserve is reducing its balance sheet? You know, a very linear, simple model says, oh, the Fed's balance sheet is increasing. That's positive for liquidity. Liquidity must be going up. When the Federal Reserve is reducing its balance sheet, liquidity must be going down. But you know, financial conditions have been easing. Stock markets up. Uh, cre credit spreads have narrowed, and um, you know, treasure market liquidity has has, has gone up. So, uh, how how would you ex explain that, Joseph? Uh, well, I think one of the so when when it comes to market liquidity. You know, it's just buyers and sellers, right? If you have a whole bunch of, if they don't meet at the right price, then you're not going to have good liquidity. One of the things that's happening is that I think many investors in the market perceived that there would be some kind of recession. And according to, to their framework, when you buy treasuries, when there's a recession. And so that's been giving a bid on the treasury market for the for the past few months. And I think that's been giving a lifeline to that market, even as QT commences. And um, if those investors change your view on the economy, maybe that that bid will go away. Um, about more broadly, though, one of the things that I think is happening is that the, the tremendous amount of QT, uh, QE in the market of, um, say, reserve assets and deposit liabilities might be making the transmission of monetary policy a little bit less effective. And by that, I mean that, so when you hike rates and one of the ways it works through the financial system is by basically increasing the opportunity cost of money. But because you have so many deposits in the system, the typical deposit rate is still around 0%, even as the Fed funds rate is approaching 5%. So for a lot of asset classes, rate hikes have never happened. And I wonder if that probably means that, well, uh, probably explains some of the uh, stability in the market and maybe a little bit of the ebullience since all these people who have zero yielding bank deposits are, are still trying to find ways to earn yield. And maybe they perceive, um, let's say, stocks and so forth to be a good, a good way to um, escape financial repression. Stephen, so I asked you previously, how are you assessing um, you know, the risk of a financial crisis? I, I'm paraphrasing, you said something like low, I think. Uh, what would have to change for that to become high? What would you have to see on your screen 
a line, a chart, a series of numbers that makes you say, oh, wow, uh, you know, all the, all the work that I've been doing on financial crisis, it's, it's going to be, um, you know, it's ex extremely important because we're about to have one. Yeah. So it's, you know, I, I'm skeptical to give you too, too much of a numeric answer because it, it, it's, it is more complicated. I mean, it's the, kind of the way I was describing it before. Are there concerns on the street about a major counterparty? Uh, are, are firms losing business uh, or a systemic firm losing business structurally? Uh, you know, there's a, a lot of smart people that have built these systemic risk indicator whatevers, and they're really, really good at predicting past crises. Um, you know, it, it's just to to watch for it on the screen is uh, our prices disappearing, our bids disappearing, our uh, credit default swaps on banks going up. I mean, th those kind of things, anything. I mean, are, are the shares trading at two bucks a share? Everything is really sort of revolving around a systemically important bank or financial institution and what's happening across the street, right? So the Credit Suisse situation is not systemic because we're not seeing this, you know, at, at really anywhere else. It, their, their situation is very idiosyncratic. Um, if what was happening to them was happening in multiple places, that would be a concern. Um, so really, you know, are, are we seeing trade failures? Are we seeing haircuts? go up uh, in, in repro transactions. So it's it's a broad suite of things and it's not gonna look the same every time, of course, uh, but a lot of times what we find is that the response can look the same uh, across these situations. So those are the kinds of things that I'm watching for. Like I said, right now, more what I'm watching for is what's the next market blow up uh, because those, those we are experiencing. We've seen commodities blow up, power markets in Europe, corporate credit in South Korea, the gilt market, a little bit the treasury market, crypto, right? So these are sort of the market blowups and, and the banks have stayed resilient and they've almost stayed on the sidelines. And that's part of, I think, the story of why we're seeing talk of central bank rescues uh, when the banks are fine, right? That's sort, of a, that's sort of a weird position historically for us to be in where we're saying, okay, the banks are resilient, but uh, we want the central bank, we want the ECB to step into commodity markets, even though banks are fine. Um, and, and that part of that is it goes back to the bank capital story and, and how these banks are sort of self self preserving um, in a modern environment, which it may be that they don't play the rescue role, uh, you know, that that we've historically encouraged them to do. Uh, and, and that's sort of the tension that we're seeing now is we're, we're letting these market blowups happen and we're talking about central bank intervention uh, and, and the banks are fine. Right. I know that a harbinger, early harbinger of the bank crisis that was to come for 2008 was the, the freezing in the securitized uh, mortgage-backed securities, subprime CDOs that happened in uh, you know, the middle of 2007, where some you know, Bear Stearns hedge funds uh, uh, failed and stuff like that. So you know, a lot of people talk, people talk about Big Short or uh, you know, Paulson's big trade. That, I think that all, that most of that happened in 2007. The bank failures were, you know, many months, if not you know, a year later. So what is the sort of, what would be the problematic collateral now? And you, know, you talk so much about bank capital, but is, is the reason though that stress is lower is just there is no so, you know, trashy assets, you know, like, like th there is no trashy asset that people are, are rating at a hundred dollars, a hundred cents on the dollar mm -hmm. that really should be 30 cents on the dollar. Of course, you know, as, as the name of your subject, without warning would suggest, we don't know what it is before. That's the, that's the nature of black swans. Uh, so yeah, to what degree is it just, there's no there's no bubble, bubble in bank related things. There may be a bubble in the equity market, whatever, other things. Mm. Uh, but when it comes to, uh, uh, there's no giant debt bubble. Um, is, is How relevant is that? And then also, you know, if, if there is a problematic asset, what do you think it is? Because I, I know you write about shadow banking as well. I want to get to shadow banking. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, I, I would say generally I have no idea what the next collateral is that's going to blow. Um, and what we know about financial crises is that they're always they're always and everywhere um, some sort of money that breaks down. So we talk about the housing market in 2008, but what what was so pernicious about it, what was so devastating about it is that it backed repo and it and it, you know, formed the backbone of these bank balance sheets. And it, so it was a breakdown in what was effectively money in in you know, short-term money assets, the repo market, commercial paper, that's what caused the financial crisis. Uh, so, you know, that, that's why we go back to those sorts of things when we're talking about where is the next financial crisis, because any collateral can break down. And, and you know, the, the, this sort of speaks, I guess, to 
you know, Fed stress tests and, you know, they'll, they'll test different asset classes depending on the year. And, and that's nice and it keeps the banks guessing. But what was so effective about the 2009 stress test is they stressed housing a whole bunch because that was what we knew was already the bad collateral. Um, and, and that's what lent, you know, so much legitimacy to those results. Um, so we may not, you know, I, I don't know. It's a macroeconomic question to say what's the next collateral that's, that's you know, supporting money that's going to blow. I mean, the f- one thing I will say is, and I mentioned this earlier, the Fed is backing a lot of money creation now in the reverse repo facility. Uh, and that money is going to be fine. Uh, and they stand behind the treasury market. So any, any sort of treasury backed repo is going to be fine. I mean, we have a much bigger government presence in money uh, than we did pre-2008, and that is stabilizing. Uh, w- without, that, without that reverse repo facility, that, that money, you know, money market fund assets would be in private repo, um, private commercial paper, uh, and treasury bills to some extent, but eventually there's a price gap that opens up, and there's, there's all kinds of incentive to issue that, that kind of paper. So uh, it, the question is, you know, wh- where's the next money spot to break? And, and I don't know, and I don't know what the collateral will be uh, but it's important to keep watching money markets, but they are much safer than they were pre 2008. Joseph, I know you're thinking that you, you have thought that the potential collateral to break could be the, the U.S. Treasury market, particularly the, the longer end. And, and certainly the Treasury market was under a lot of stress last year. Has the improvement in liquidity, particularly Treasury market liquidity, as well as the fall in inflation, which you know would on the margin increase uh, demand for, for Treasuries, uh, theoretically, has that uh, made you slightly less concerned about a Treasury market blow up or, or does that worry remain uh, in, in equal force? The worry remains. Um, so like, like Steven, when I look around the financial system, everything looks fine. I think we've really done a good job in making things safer. But part of it, of course, is that the risk has been, in, in a sense, socialized. And so it's moved from the private sector to the public sector. So I guess the thinking now for, for me is now, how does that manifest? If, if we know that if, it, if anything bad happens, we'll have the public sector jump in and, and gobble up the losses. What does that mean for the risk of the public sector? And if there were to be a blow up in the public sector, what would that look like? One of my favorite economic analysts, Martin Armstrong talks about that sometimes there are problems in the private sector and when that happens, as it did in the 1930s, everyone rushes into the assets of the public sector. But sometimes as we see throughout history, the public sector has issues too. I think that manifests one in higher yields as the issuance is just structurally huge going forward and higher inflation as well, because in a sense, when you're issuing treasuries, you are just printing a form of money. So I I don't think that it's necessarily something that will be, I guess, very sudden, but I think gradually uh, the risks just build up. It The way that the public sector is being managed financially is is just not uh, just not sustainable and really not reasonable either. Joseph, when we first did our first interview on forward guidance, you said that you know, throughout after the great financial crisis, the Federal Reserve wanted to stimulate the economy via the wealth effect. But now you know, the wealth effect is too high. They want the reverse wealth effect. So they want the value of stocks and bonds to go down. You know, investors who are paying attention to this should, should act accordingly. Uh, that, that thesis played out extraordinarily well in, in 2022. Now that we're a year, you know, over a year past that, and the Federal Reserve has done a lot of work on hiking rates, uh, as well as quantitative tightening, and the stock and bond market have fallen value, fallen in value significantly, particularly the bond market. But, but you know, they're on a little bit of a, you know, a tear right now, a, sort of a new bull market, people are saying. How would you uh, assess you know, your original prog- prognostication, um, which you know, has aged well? Would, would you alter it? Would you say things are different now? Um, no. So, so I think right now what's happening in the market is that you have two different narratives as to how the future looks. Um, you have one narrative um, where inflation will be persistent in the market. And so what we saw last year will continue to play out. And you have another narrative in that inflation is coming down soon. The Fed is going to cut rates. And so we'll all go back to um, how things were. Um, let's say in, in before 2020, and I still, I mean, believe that we are in a different regime where inflation will be persistently high, and that means that um, 
I still think interest rates will continue to rise, especially longer dated interest rates. Um, what that means for, for um, equities, uh, I'm not actually super clear um, because you have a lot of things that go into, into equities beyond simply where interest rates are. What I feel more comfortable saying is that I, I feel like the dollar will be continuing to strengthen probably significantly so simply because as we raise interest rates throughout the world, some countries have more, I guess how monetary policy transmits is different from each country. For other countries, you can go a little bit higher and you have a big impact like you see in Canada, where the Bank of Canada has basically called it quits simply because a lot of their mortgages are short tenors. And so you just hike a little bit and that immediately gets felt throughout their households. But the Fed, the US is very different. The households here are much more resistant to interest rate hikes. And so as interest rate, as central banks around the world try to fight inflation, the Fed can go and has to go higher than others. So that I think mechanically widens the interest rate differential for, um, for, for the dollar compared to other currencies. Mm. Steven, I know that when interest rates go up, banks can make more money on their new loans. However, when interest rates rise, it can decrease the value of their holdings of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. You know, same thing as the Federal Reserve owns. Uh, you know, advanced, large, you know, GSIPs, globally systemically important banks can you know, hedge that with interest rate swaps. But you know, the the Bank of you know Minnesota, the you know small time like community banks may not have access or, or, you know, be familiar with the sorts of, of hedges. And so I'm hearing, you know, you know, anecdotally, admittedly reports of uh, small banks with throughout the United States that are functionally in, insolvent in terms of their, their tangible book value. If they were forced to sell everything uh, would be the, that value would be less than the value of, of their um, liabilities. And, you know, if you own something like XLF, which is, you know, owns Berkshire Hathaway, JP Morgan, Bank of America, you know, the, that may not affect those, but you know that this makes a real difference all across America. Um, how concerned are you? Have you looked into this at all? And how concerned are you uh, as a market risk? Yeah, I would say I'm not incredibly concerned. Um, you know, the, the thing to remember about banks is, is that they're 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 always conditionally insolvent, right? I mean, every bank is insolvent under the right conditions right now. I mean, J.P. Morgan, you. you you impose the right conditions on them, they're insolvent. If every customer went withdrew, obviously insolvent. Um, and that's why it's so much of uh, a question of balance sheet mechanics, as in, can the balance sheet continue to move forward? Can the balance sheet continue to do the operations of banking? And these community banks, you know, it's not clear that community banks are, are going to face a massive run uh, because the, the mark to market value of their bonds has gone down. Uh, you know, obviously a lot, a lot of the stuff doesn't need to be accounted for that way and things like that. Uh, and the fed has ways to, to accommodate this with rate cuts if they need it, but they don't, um, you know, there's a discount window and other things like that. So I, I'm not incredibly concerned about this. Um, and you know, th this just goes to, it serves as another reminder of why being a bank and having your product be money is a great business to be in because they're still minting 0% interest rate deposit accounts. Uh, to fund their their continued operations, so um, th you know this seems pretty pretty uh, stable on a go forward basis, at least for the time being. Yeah, and, and so, I mean, JP Morgan, um, the, you know, very low deposit rates, but you know, I've seen CDs as high as like four point nine percent or it's above five percent from from small time banks who have to compete a lot more aggressively uh, for those deposits. And yeah, I mean, the reason JP Morgan isn't feeling the the, the mismatch of they have to you know, borrow at five percent to earn a, a lower percent on on a risk, you know inverted yield curve, which I want, want to ask you as well, is because of uh, they can charge so low for the deposits. But for you know smaller banks, that might not be true. I also want to ask you about, about inverted yield curve, Stephen, which you know, as as you and Joseph and I know uh, frequently precedes a re recession. Uh, in fact, it's, it's hard to find a recession that's not preceded by an in inverted yield curve. Um, what do you think about the theory that inverted yield curve doesn't only predict a recession, it actually causes it because it just sort of causes distress in the, in, in the money market. And, uh, you know, how, if, 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 what, to what degree, if any, does that affect your perception of financial risk? You know, the, the two tens is, is 80 basis points of burden. Yeah, I would say generally, um, it, it, it can add to stress. There are funding structures that make sense, uh, more on an upward sloping yield curve. I mean, this is probably some of the distress we're seeing in, in you know, some of the firms I mentioned earlier that are 
are are essentially doing the business of banking, but they're you know selling cars or whatever. Um, you know th that it totally weighs on their funding structure. Um, if you're a diversified financial institution, this is less of a concern. So I would say, does it cause a recession? You know, not mechanically. Does it add stress to certain players in, in the economy? Absolutely. Now, now let's move on to the the debt ceiling. Uh, I'm, yeah. What, Stephen? Can you just walk us through, walk the audience through the, the debt ceiling? What are the various um, uh, risks? At what point will the U.S. government actually run out of money? And how big of a of a problem is it if if we have a, a technical default? Yeah. So uh, we don't know when we'll run out of money exactly. Um, it looks like it would be sometime over the summer in the event that the debt ceiling wasn't raised. And just as a reminder, the debt ceiling uh, has nothing to do with spending. This is basically a, a totally separate uh, legislative item. The debt ceiling has to be raised in order for the Treasury to pay for spending that's already been authorized. Um, so it, it seems like we'll run out of funding at some point over the summer. And in the event that you know we sort of hit that what's called the X date, uh, it remains an open question, and, and both uh, Janet Yellen and Jay Powell have sort of demurred when it comes to what their priorities would be in the event of a, of a technical default. A lot of folks think that it would prioritization would be given to the U.S. Treasury debt, just given its importance in the international financial system. That is politically uh, probably a nightmare. Uh, I, I, I that's pretty self evident, but I I will leave it at that. I mean, you're, you're talking about not paying. Uh, you know, government salaries or pensions or things like that, and and you're you're paying off the government debt, and then you can imagine the headlines like, oh, the U.S. government pays China but not their soldiers, like uh, all sorts of bad political heat like that. Uh, the other question then is, what does the Fed do, if anything? Uh, the Fed really, again, Jay Powell has demurred and said this is Treasury's responsibility, this is Congress's responsibility. Uh, the Fed, I think, would would be willing to accommodate. I mean, I mean, the Fed can only shirk its responsibility so much, right? I mean, the Fed doesn't want to come out now and say, "Yes, whatever happens with the debt ceiling, we will buy up any defaulted debt. We will totally, you know, we will totally cushion the system. Congress, do whatever you want, um, and and we'll do our best to to put foam on the runway." That being said, I think they, you know, they have a they have a legally mandated responsibility to provide stability to the system and implement monetary policy. And this would interfere with that. And so in the event that there is a technical default and it persists um, and starts to cause disruption, I think the Fed would would maybe have to step in. Um, I don't think they would be have a strong appetite to in the event that a political solution was nowhere on the horizon. Uh, you know, the Fed likes to do deals where it's sort of shielded by Treasury or others um, where they say, look, we're three days from a deal. Fed, can you help us out? Um, you know, the Fed's probably more comfortable with that than sort of an open-ended intervention, but they don't, they really don't want to be involved. Hmm. Joseph, what do you, what do you make of this? Uh, I agree with Stephen. And I, I'd also add, so my base case is that, you know, the Fed would do something because they're scared that the market would collapse because they don't really know what will happen. And um, the, the, the Fed by its nature, I think is very cautious and conservative. So they would do something. Uh, I think an interesting point that I heard from Jim Bianco is that, you know, prioritization is probably illegal. And the reason for that is that if you are the executive branch and you're kind of prioritizing who you pay and who you don't pay, you're, you're, you're kind of aggregating a lot of power to yourself that, that, that you shouldn't have. Let's say that Congress passes something that you don't like. Okay. Then I just, I just will put money into it. You know, that's a kind of a clear violation of, of the separation of, Powers. So, um, that being said, I, I am sure that when there's a crisis, uh, many many rules disappear. Especially since you are also the judge and jury for for evaluating whether something is illegal or not. Oh, also, I, I'd like to add something about uh, the the discussion, Jack. You asked about the losses banks have on their balance sheets from interest rate increases. I think one other thing to, to keep in mind is that so when interest rates rise, the banks are losing money on their assets. But there's also a liability side as well. If you think of a bank deposit as a zero coupon perpetual debt, an IOU forever, then when interest rates rise, that liability becomes much less valuable. So there's two aspects here. The fixed income assets are worth less, but the liabilities are as well. 
So the impact on your net worth is, is not super clear. But Joseph, it, uh, zero, it, it does have a coupon, right? Because if, if interest rates go to 10%, eventually deposit rates will go up. Uh, right now, they're like, I don't know how much they'll go up, but right now they're still very close to zero. So yeah. you basically, and, you're a bank, you have a trillion dollars of deposit outstanding, yielding zero, and interest rates are like, like four, four and three quarters. Your liabilities are worth less. Particularly on checking accounts. I mean, those those will barely yeah. budge because that's, that's a service. And the other thing I'll say, Jack, just on that too, I mean, you know, you express some some real worry about community banks having to compete with JP Morgan, who can more easily offer zero percent. And I think that's real. And I think we need to think about that as financial fringe too. I mean, the U.S. is probably overbanked. Uh, do we need five thousand banks and five thousand credit unions? Probably not. Uh, so that we can think about that as financial, you know, brush that needs to be burned out too, to some degree. Mm, wow. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I feel a, a lot of people, particularly in, in banking, say that the U.S. does not have enough banks because you know there's been so much comp- consolidation over the past years. So that's that's really interesting. Uh, and I want to ask you both about you know a, a year ago when interest rates were at zero, people said the Fed the Fed can't hike because there's there's too much debt. It's going to break. The Fed is going to break something. Uh, well, you know the, the interest rates are now at you know four point seven five percent, and nothing is broken yet. Uh, but I imagine that there is a level of interest rates where something will break. I mean, it could be as high as, you know, if interest rate is 30%, I'm going to take a guess that, that things are broken. Um, I, I probably gather that both of you think that that level of, you know, breakage uh, is, is higher than a, a lot of other uh, folks in, in finance. But, you know, at what level does do things start to break? Uh, Stephen, you first, and then Joseph. Uh, I would say, I don't know. I mean, that, I don't know what, what, you know, what 50 basis points puts the mark, puts various markets over. Um, I don't think anybody, I don't think the Fed knows or they wouldn't probably do it. Uh, So yeah, I mean, that will remain an open question. uh, To me, the more interesting question is, is what do we do if and when that happens? And is the Fed prepared to do that? And that part I'm not so sure about. And I think that might be part of the story for why the market has priced the more dovish Fed then then the Fed is sort of trying to tell the market for itself. I think the market has some tail risk priced in that the Fed, if the Fed goes too far and there is some market breakage, that the Fed's response is going to be rate cuts. Um, and I don't know. I mean, that's sort of the old playbook. That's sort of the Greenspan playbook. And in a high inflation environment, I don't know that that's appropriate. And they have other tools, but I don't know that the Fed, the Fed has a sort of an order of, an order of operations that it likes. Um, and rate cuts come first. So that, that's a reason we'll be with the market. But if the Fed did some serious communicating, it could maybe talk them out of it and, and sort of play up its other tools to intervene in a market breakage besides rate cuts. Yeah, I also have no idea when when it's too high either. I'm, I'm surprised that we got so smoothly up to, to close to 5%. So this surprised me. And I and that suggests that there's real resilience in the financial system. And one way we can see this is that household net worths are still, you know, very, very high, just close to all-time highs. And as we've been talking about, the banking sector is strong. Some segments of the markets that were not strong, like the crypto world, uh, they they got hit badly. But everything else seems to seems to be working well. So, um, uh, if there are fred- if there are places that are being stressed by interest rates where they are now, I, it, it's not obvious to me what they are. Right. And so now I want to talk about other pockets of stress, which which could be the, the focal point of a blow up or a systemic crisis. So we already talked about the sovereign market, uh, treasuries, other other sovereigns. I want to talk about the shadow banking system uh, and private equity, which are, which are related. So uh, these are both financing vehicles that used to be very associated with banks, but now are not in the wake of the great financial crisis. So shadow banking, I mean, it's many things uh, like swaps and stuff, but I'm I'm really thinking about uh, sort of consumer loans that are originated by non-banks that, you know, maybe they have a fancy or sort of cute sounding name and they they fund themselves via venture capital or equity money. Maybe they went public via a SPAC and, you know, that money, that funding is kind of dried up. Uh, and, and they're unprofitable businesses because they're, they're you know they're, they're lending uh, at, at very low rates, as well as private equity. Where, you know, the business model is to buy private companies at, at low valuations and to increase returns by borrowing a lot of money. Um, you know, we had a, a very 
bubblicious time in, in private markets for, for venture capital as well as companies could be taken over by by SPACs. So, you know, if you're private equity and you're getting paid to do deals, you're going to do deals. And you were buying companies that might not have been un, as, as undervalued uh, as they were in the past. Maybe they were even overvalued. And by the way, you were borrowing at, you know, at 0% plus a spread. Now you're borrowing at 4.75% plus a spread. I imagine that challenges that bet business model a little bit. So yeah, Stephen, how, how are you thinking about the risk within uh, shadow banking as sort of you know, fintech uh, as well as uh, private equity? I would say it's important to think about the way that private equity or, or, or similar, you know, private credit, similar actors fail and what happens when they do. So, uh, you know, for instance, there's been a lot of hype recently over Blackstone having to pause withdrawals in that in their real estate fund. And these are funds and entities that can can sort of go into wind down mode and realize the value of their assets over their liabilities, right? So they have long-term funding that they can they can lock in if they need to. If it's not already locked in, um, they can manage their assets, you know, to to fruition. Uh, it's not the same as say a, a systemically important bank, which is sort of lending its balance sheet out to the whole system to do credit and liquidity transformation and do prime brokerage and provide overnight financing and things like this and and like we've talked about before, providing the the short term money uh, holdings as well, whether it's in deposits or repos. Um, so this is much more of a matched book type scenario um, in the, in these you know long longer term funding and longer term assets. And in the event that they fail or they you know they are overrun with withdrawals, um, the, you know it's a macroeconomic question. And right now, it seems like the Fed is okay with that deal. Like if if SoFi or Loan Depot or or uh, you know some big private equity fund has to wind down, uh, the Fed might view that as a tightening of financial conditions and and a discipline of the market. And that's that's a case where they can more credibly do so. You know, Joseph has talked about uh, the, the very real concerns with moral hazard and and. Broadly, uh, you know, we do need to have a more serious discussion, a more serious structure around what actually gets rescued in a crisis and how we treat that preemptively. Um, because, for instance, there's no credibility to saying that the Fed's not going to rescue money market funds. Like, th there's just no credibility to that, or that they're not going to rescue someone with a two hundred and fifty-one thousand dollar deposit because FDIC insurance runs out of two fifty, right? I mean, that's it's just not credible. Um, but there are there are entities like this where there, it's a macroeconomic story, but you know, inflation's a little high. Unemployment's at three point four percent. You can let a big credit fund go go under. Um, you may you may have to manage the the the, the sort of you know ripple effects, um, but there are ways to do that, and there are institutions that can do that. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder, is it? You know, the this financial system in 2007 was dominated by banks, mm. and if a failure of a one private equity company, one shadow bank lender, definitely would not have caused a financial crisis. But does the fact that so much of the activity, so much of the action, happens now not within the regulated banking system, but within private equity, within shadow banking, does that make it you know more likely? And you know, as someone who's looking at the past, you know, every crisis is, is different. I mean, do, do you think it's possible that? There, it actually is big enough to be to be systemic. Yeah, I think it goes back to the question of activity, and and we talk about 2008 as technically you know being involved in non banks. When you look at Bear Stearns, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs back then, they were technically non banks, um, but they were effectively doing the activities of banking. Um, they were using their balance sheet to to manufacture liquidity and manufacture credit and. Um, you know, though they were funding things on an overnight basis and providing that those money assets, and they they were competitors with banks. Like they didn't have serious credit lines from banks backing them up uh, in the way that somebody like a like a you know a non bank lender might today. Um, so those were effectively banks, and you know you can move activity outside the system, and it, yeah, it's substantially outside the system at this point, and I think that gives the ability that gives the system more ability to start to lose credit and lose, uh, you know, bear losses basically um, and keep them outside of the systemic part that touches everybody. And that that's probably part of the story of what we've seen so far. Like we said, the thinly capitalized mortgage lenders and things like that that are on the fringe of the system have gone under 
And there's a macroeconomic impact that the margin, somebody's not getting a loan. And right now we're saying that's what we want. Um, and it doesn't affect, you know, my, you know, my confidence in the banking system or yours. Uh, so to some extent, that's good. I mean, there, there's something special about being a bank and, and having that balance sheet that can manufacture deposits and can provide those services across the system. And so to the extent that credit risk moves outside of that system, uh, I think that's okay. And it's still ultimately backstopped by banks. Uh, you know, they have the most senior position in these firms because uh, they're the ultimate source of funds. So I think it, it's, it's really a, a shift in the seniority position of banks in credit risk. And I think that's okay. Mm. And, and yes, so Joseph, how do you think about the connection between you know, regulated banks and non-banks? You know, one example, two examples, you know, both of which when you were at the Fed, one is the September 2019 repo crisis when I think it was hedge funds, you know, non-banks who were you know, using all that borrowed money that, re- that required an intervention. I, I could, be, could be wrong with that. Um, and then another is, is you know, March 2020, which you know, as you know, in uh, Nick Timorose's book, uh, it was actually, I mean, this is part of it, but private equity companies, uh, companies that were owned by private equity uh, just were told by their owners uh, who were you know, financially sophisticated people to just uh, tap their credit lines as soon as possible. And that is what led to like a, a, such a huge drain that partly freaked the Fed out. One of many things that freaked the Fed out. But um, yeah, w- w- what, do you, what do you think? No, I think sh- the shadow making sector is a broad sector. It's comprised of many different actors from you know, things like mortgage REITs to, um, to, to big private equity, private credit funds. I think one thing to note, though, is that if you are an investor in a, in a big, say, PE firm or a big private credit firm, you are in a sophisticated investor, accredited investor. That is to say, you're someone rich. And so you can afford to take these losses from the investor side. And I think there's a lot less, I think, social damage and there's a lot less media outrage when rich person loses some money. So that's, that's not as big a deal. But about the people who are dependent upon borrowing from these shadow banks, uh, if if these um, shadow banks go under, then then, then these 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 entities that were relying on them, they have other sources of funds as well. They can come into the regulated banking sector and borrow from the big banks that we have, and uh, the big banks have capacity, or actually the banking system in general has capacity to make loans to them, or they can show up in the capital markets and um, you know issue a bond like a like like Google or something like that. So the overall impact, I think is that you are bringing more of the shadow banking sector into the light, so to speak, because as they go under, and if they still if they still need funds, they'll have to go to avenues that are better regulated. So it's, it's, not, it's not bad for that to happen. And um, yeah, so I think it's something that so far, simply because it's the lenders that people can withstand the loss and the companies have other avenues, it's, it's not a big deal so far, but of course, a lot of the people who made bad loans and invested in things that had no opportunity of succeeding, those losses are, are going to be, you know, there, just like we saw in the publicly, publicly traded SPAC areas. Mm, yeah. So um, final question uh, for you both is about inflation. Uh, tomorrow is not only Valentine's Day, it is a CPI day where we'll, we'll learn January's inflation figures. Um, yeah, now, number one is just your, your broad thoughts on inflation. I mean, uh, do you think the fight is over? Joseph, I, I know you think the fight is, is not yet over. And then how does inflation itself impact financial stability as, as well as uh, financial crisis uh, risk? Maybe Joseph, maybe we'll start with you and Stephen, I'll give you the final word. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I, I'm not going to rehash my view of why I think inflation is going to be more persistent in the coming years. I, I do think it, it was a financial stability risk because there is a, the, because of the level of debt. And so when there is inflation and when interest rates rise, another way to think about this is simply that you are forcing losses on fixed income uh, investors. And there's going to be a lot of people who are going to lose a lot of money. And we saw that happen last year. And if inflation is persistent, that might continue. And so there's going to be a very well, one, the level of wealth in the system will decline. And secondly, it, the distribution of that might not be very equal. So you could have segments that are more fragile, you know, have more distress. But overall, it's, um, I think it's, it's something that people haven't seen a lot in the past few decades. And so they might not have planned for. But it, it has the potential to be very disruptive if it's, if it's persistent. Stephen? 
I would say I have I have no inflation forecast. Uh, I do think it's a little goofy that we're still talking about who won the uh, transitory debate, just not because the the answer is so obvious, but because we'll we'll literally never know. Rates are at five percent, right? It's like saying that Arthur Burns was right about inflation because Volcker killed it later. Like we'll we'll uh, you know we'll sort of never know. Um, any inflation can be transitory if you take rates to 100%, right? So uh, I think we should put that debate to rest, if nothing else. But uh, as far as the risk, yeah, I mean, Joseph is right. Like, you know, thinking about inflation, you you typically don't think, at least in, in recent decades, about advanced economies. Uh, you sort of think of inflation as it relates to currency and sovereign risk. And that's not the experience of the U.S. right now. So it, it mat or the advanced world in general. Um, so it matters to the extent it matters for interest rates and all the things we've been talking about and sort of what blows up um, in a in a rising interest rate environment um, and what stresses emerge then. So those those stresses matter. Um, you know that that sort of will be the impact I think of inflation going forward. Mm. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks, Joseph. Uh, people can find you on, on Twitter, Stephen, at stephenkelly49. Uh, your Substack is uh, without warning. And Joseph- By the way, guys, Stephen's Substack is really good. It's been featured many times on Financial Times as well. So you definitely should check it out. Yes. Thanks, it, Joseph. It is excellent. And Joseph, you are rising. You can find at fedguy.com. And on, on Twitter, you are at fedguy12. Thank you so much again. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Forward Guidance, the program you just enjoyed, hopefully, can be viewed on YouTube at BlockWorks Macro or heard as a podcast on Apple Podcast and Spotify. Episodes are typically released on Apple and Spotify a few hours before they air on YouTube. Please leave a review on Apple Podcast if you feel so inclined. Check out today's sponsor, public.com at public.com slash forward guidance. That's public.com slash forward guidance. Also, you can get 10% off to Permissionless 2023 and BlockWorks Research using code GUIDANCE10. Thanks again, and be well.